Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Brooke Parks. I'm an environmental science major with a public health minor. Um, and I'll be your moderator for tonight's UNE One Night Teaching on Climate and Justice for the um, panel on protecting public health. So a quick overview, each panelist is going to speak for five minutes about climate change and how it's affecting human health. After all the panelists' comments, we'll open up to questions and discussions with the audience and our panelists. Um, so to introduce our panelists for this evening, we have Dr. Fida Arafat, um, Professor of Osteopathic Medicine, Bethany, Bethany Fortier, Associate Clinical Professor and School of Nursing and Population Health, Dr. Tom User, Director of Center for Excellence in Aging and Health, Dr. Anna L. Bass, Associate Teaching Professor of Biology, and lastly, Jennifer Gunderman, Director of Maine Area Health Education Center Network and Center for Excellence in Public Health. Um, so we're going to hand it off with Professor Arafat, who will be speaking about health and disparities, the past, the present, and the future. Thank you. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. So um, um, what I wanted to talk about today is uh, health equity and uh, also uh, what affects uh, health disparities. And if you can look here, uh, we have always uh, policies and programs that can impact health factors. And this will impact health outcomes in the form of length of life and quality of life. Those health factors that we're talking about usually are health behaviors in terms of tobacco use and alcohol and diet and exercise, clinical care with its available, quality care and access, and social and economic factors like um, uh, education, employment, and income. And finally, physical environment where we live. And all that is impacted at the end by the policies and the programs that, um, um, that decide those factors. So um, what I wanted to tell you here in the beginning, we had, uh, so we had here, um, I wanted to show you some maps here. This is a map for uh, the city of Brooklyn. Uh, this is in 1938, uh, the Homeowner Loan Corporation, basically a uh, red line that's specific areas uh, that usually on the outer skirts of cities. Um, and uh, uh, those cities, those areas were uh, inhabited by uh, uh, minority population. Uh, here's one also for Atlanta. And uh, these, basically those red areas in those uh, neighborhoods were uh, uh, mapped as to be for uh, banks to, uh, to practice responsible lending. So people living in those areas were not able to get uh, loans for their homes. And here is for the city of Oakland. Um, so they were derived from a time when the American government believed, government believed that uh, inharmonious racial groups should not uh, should be separated. So um, this was not just in those areas; it was all over the United States. And you can see uh, we have red areas; uh, these were basically the minorities and the uh, um, foreign-born, and the green were the best areas where businessmen. In between them, either you'll be um, uh, white. Uh, you know, working class white people or poor white people in yellow. So uh, this had impacted definitely the, uh, the ones that were, you know, lived in those red areas were mostly uh, black uh, people. Um, the problem with that is that uh, this led to uh, those neighborhoods suffered because they uh, were poor. People did not have, have the ability to buy their homes and they were, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, did not have a uh, playground, swimming pools, uh, marketing outlets for tobacco increase and for alcohol and exposure to stress also. In addition to, in those neighborhoods, there were, um, you know, as we heard from the Reverend today, uh, coal fire, you know, uh, plants in, in those neighborhoods. And we still uh, are, uh, you know, people living in Flint, Michigan are still suffering from uh, the poisonous water they have. So uh, definitely this impacted also medical care in those neighborhoods. They don't have uh, pharmacies that have their medications. Hospitals there will um, close or uh, they will not uh, have also um, access to care, good care in those neighborhoods. And also people who are working in those neighborhoods, they don't have access to uh, specialists and all that. Um, so with that in mind, if we look at the metrics for the people who lived in those uh, neighborhoods, compare them to people who lived in uh, those nice neighborhoods, you can see on many uh, levels, life expectancy is much short, shorter in, in those uh, neighborhoods. Minorities are much higher, poverty is much higher. Many diseases are uh, much higher percentages, obesity, 
and uh, that makes a huge difference. What else is here? Um, uh, we know that actually if we erase those residential uh, segregation, we can erase the difference between black and white in uh, uh, many aspects like earnings and high school graduation rates and unemployment. Um, so um, uh, there was a report that came from uh, the Institute of Medicine showing that we have uh, that minority in every level we get less treatment and less diagnostics. And uh, that is not a surprise for, uh, for us. And uh, we can come to that conclusion from, uh, you know, uh, levels of racism. This is by uh, Dr. Canary Jones, that uh, people living in those neighborhoods who are, you know, struggling with these soil, bad soil, and of course, bad health, uh, when we compare them to uh, people living in nice neighborhoods with good health and good soil, uh, they will grow healthy. Here, of course, the growth will be impacted. And uh, there was also going to be a level of what we call internalized, internalized racism, because people who are living in those neighborhoods might think that they are uh, maybe not good enough. Maybe that's their, uh, you know, that's because of them. It's not because of the environment they live in. So um, that can impact in so many ways, uh, you know, the racism, those people living in those neighborhoods, they, they are exposed to racism day in and day out, which can impact so many aspects of their life, like, you know, getting a job or obtaining a bank loan or uh, their quality of life in general. And research has shown that all these can lead to what we call biological weathering, or basically uh, a more increase of allostatic load, which is basically the chronic exposure to stress that, that can impact a person's life and um, <clears throat> can actually shorten the lifespan of uh, many people. Uh, we also found that there are changes in the DNA that can happen with chronic stress, like for example, in um, you know, epigenetics. Uh, you know, epigenetics are changes that happen in the DNA molecule after a, a long time of stress. So we found that actually those epigenetics related to stress can uh, cause uh, diseases like cardiovascular disease, cancer, preterm birth, and others. Um, so um, that's it. I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to give it to uh, Dr. Yeah. Wow. The taller the better, right? All right. So I'm really excited to talk with you this evening about the reciprocal relationship between the built environment and climate change. So we already know that the Earth's climate is changing, and this is due largely to greenhouse gas emissions resulting from human activity. These human-generated gases uh, derive in part from aspects of the built environment, such as buildings, um, in building construction and operation, transportation systems and infrastructure, and land use planning. So surprisingly, um, or maybe not surprisingly to many of us, the built environment actually is responsible for 39% of all gas emissions. So what is the built environment? Well, the built environment is the infrastructure of cities and towns that includes transportation, roadways, buildings, and land use. So it's distinct from the natural environment in that the built environment is comprised of man-made components of people's surroundings, from small scale settings such as schools, um, hospitals, shopping malls, offices, to large scale settings such as neighborhoods and communities, as well as roads, sidewalks, green spaces, and connecting transit systems. So the built environment in influences human choices, which in turn affect health and the global climate. Neighborhood design not only influences health by affecting physical activity, respiratory and cardiac health, injury risk, chronic disease risk, social connectedness, and mental health, but many current community design practices also adversely contribute to global climate change. The UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has noted the relationship between components of the built environment and climate change reporting that global greenhouse gas emissions have grown largely as a result of particular um, sectors, which include transportation and buildings. Strategies that aim to reduce atmospheric CO2 include decreased use of motor vehicles and increased energy efficiency in buildings. 
Transportation and buildings are just two aspects of the built environment that can affect vulnerable populations, such as children, the elderly, racial and ethnic minorities, and people of low SES, particularly when effects on health are not incorporated into built environment decision making. These populations are also among the groups most susceptible to health effects caused by climate change, as discussed with our first speaker. One aspect of the built environment, transportation, the largest end use consumer of energy, affects human health directly through air pollution and subsequent respiratory effects, as well as indirectly through physical activity behavior. Transportation infrastructure, uh, and systems affect both greenhouse gas emissions and public health. Transportation patterns are related to pedestrian and motor vehicle fatalities, as well as non-fatal injuries. Transportation infrastructure affects physical activity as well. So we know that walking, bicycling, running, um, and using mass transit for commuting purposes can increase physical activity which in turn enhances psychological well-being and reduces risks of mortality, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and depression. Less time in cars reduces exposure to busy traffic while simultaneously reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Communities highly dependent on automobiles pose mobility barriers uh, for children, older adults, those that perhaps don't have a vehicle, uh, and people with mobility impairments. So accessible, walkable, and safe neighborhoods with mixed land use, um, good connectivity, public transit options, and recreational facilities encourage people with limited mobility to stay physically active, independent, and involved in community activities. Aspects of the built environment that facilitate physical activity for all populations offer the co-benefit of reducing motor vehicle associated pollution, therefore diminishing both health hazards and the greenhouse gas emissions contributing to climate change. So buildings also contribute to climate change, um, influence transportation and affect health through materials used, um, decisions about sites, electricity and water usage, and landscape surroundings. Buildings affect greenhouse gas emission through various aspects of their design, um, their location and location orientation and use, such as their relationship to each other and the neighboring landscape, the material composition and design elements of their interiors and exteriors, and the energy and water resources used by their occupants. So a building's energy use is also affected by features of its surrounding environment, such as sunlight, water, wind, trees, which in turn also impacts greenhouse gas emissions. Climate change and its effects on temperature, precipitation, storm patterns, sea level rise, and other environmental processes have important implications for the construction, maintenance, and operations of buildings and infrastructure. The risks posed by climate change in this context are threefold. So climate-related phenomena such as flooding, um, and heat waves can directly impair the performance and longevity of buildings and infrastructure. These phenomena can also alter the nature and magnitude of environmental impacts associated with a particular project, such as surface runoff and the release of hazardous substances. Finally, climate change can increase the vulnerability of the surrounding environment to the environmental impacts of a project. So what can we do about it from a public health perspective? Um, it is going to be key that we work across sectors to incorporate a health promotion approach, not only in the design um, and the development of built environment components. These things um, will really help to mitigate climate change, promote adaptation, and improve public health. Built environment strategies that promote climate change mitigation through transportation infrastructure, and building infrastructure really provide us with opportunities both to improve health and reduce climate change. By combining various built environment strategies through complementary policies and programs, multiple co-benefits emerge. Encouraging leadership and collaboration among various professions with the built environment, climate change, 
and public health is truly an important step toward reducing greenhouse gas emissions, thereby mitigating climate change effects and promoting healthier living. Built environment design and development can help mitigate climate change, support adaptation, and improve environment and public health. The more resilient the built environment, the less impact from climate change. I'm going to pass it to our next speaker, Dr. Music. Thank you. I'd like to take us on a little journey uh, from maybe the macro level to the micro. We're going to get to know a woman named Betty Prentice, a widow, age 84. She lives alone with her cat, Tipsy, on the top floor of a rent-controlled apartment building in Brooklyn, New York. Built in 1924, the building is six stories high and has one elevator and two stairwells. The elevator was installed in 1960 and is slated to be replaced as soon as the landlord saves up enough money. A retired middle school librarian, Betty is surrounded by books, over a thousand volumes, uh, lined floor to ceiling shelves on three walls of her apartment. And she spends her days reading, talking with friends on the phone, and daily walks to the corner store for essentials, but also for socialization. Betty's health isn't the best, but she maintains a positive attitude and pushes herself to stay engaged in life. You lose it if you don't use it, she says. Betty is 50 pounds overweight and suffers from high blood pressure, macular degeneration, and sarcopenic obesity. That's when muscle loss and weight gain are combined. She relies on a walker to get around safely. Her primary care doctor, who she sees about quarterly, monitors her for diabetes and uh, because her blood sugars are kind of borderline high. Betty's daughter, Sarah, lives in Portland, Maine, and gets down to see her mother once every few months. The last time Sarah visited, she noticed how hot her mother's apartment was. It was an especially warm June day, and the inside temperature was 81 degrees. Sarah promptly closed the one open window and turned on the two window AC units. So show of hands, is Betty vulnerable to climate change based upon the story you just heard? What do you think? Raise your hand if you think so. Is she vulnerable? Okay, I see lots of hands. Um, I would agree, I would raise my hand. Two, um, we have microphones in the ceiling. Are they active for this? Do we know? Yeah. So I have a few thoughts about why she's vulnerable I'd like to share with you, but it strikes me as might be nice to be a little interactive here. So why is Betty vulnerable? What about the story jumped out at you? What elements of her story? Her health, she's obese and has um, other health issues. Sorry, I can't read Okay, yeah, so she has some health complications. We'll talk about these. Yeah, what else? How the heat affects her, her um, health conditions. How the heat affects her health conditions. You want to say a little bit more about that? What did you notice in the story about the issue of heat and maybe te temperature sensitivity? It's just higher. I mean, if her daughter Sarah walked in and the temperature was really high, I mean, I just think of my, my aging parents how they are, like they relate to the change in temperature mm -hmm. um, depending on their different health conditions. So I think, yeah, I think that the heat is making it worse. Mm -hmm. Great. Anybody else want to jump in with a thought? Did she not notice? Did she not notice the heat? Yeah. So she was unaware of how hot her unit was. And that, that's an issue for many aging adults. So there's lots we can consider and in my five minutes, we can only um, scrape the surface. But my goal with this is to kind of make some of this real from the perspective of an aging adult. I run the aging center. This is something I care about. And if you look at the statistics of who gets severely ill or dies in climate events, heat waves, bad storms, it's the older people. Um, they're more susceptible to heat stroke and exhaustion because their bodies don't shed heat as easily. Our sweat glands change as we age. If we add other health conditions to that, it gets more complicated. I would even say Betty's attitude 
uh, by pushing herself could end up being a problem in a warming climate. So she, part of her routine is to go to the corner store to get her essentials, but also to speak to her neighbors. Pretty common thing in Brooklyn. My son lives in Brooklyn. Um, but that getting out and pushing herself in a hotter climate could in itself become a problem. Is she fully aware of temperature change? I know from my 86 year old father, he always liked to keep the, the temperature in our house cold, but I've been visiting him recently and it's stifling and he doesn't recognize it. And so his perception of heat is part of it. Many older adults also do not have a the same perception of thirst. So dehydration is another big issue. And it's a double whammy. If you're not paying attention to the heat and you're not getting enough to drink, you're really putting yourself at risk. Um, she's mobility disabled because of her physical status. And that could be a problem in a crisis. If there's a power outage as a result of a bad storm, she's stuck on the top floor. Um, She's borderline diabetic, and I bring up the diabetes because that is a condition that's known to um, uh, reduce heat tolerance, just having that condition and the treatments that go with it. Another one is hypertension. Some of the drugs used for hypertension actually make it more difficult for the body to shed heat. A few other things in terms of her, where she is, she's on the top floor, so top floor is where the heat go rises. Um, she also has a thermal mass. She's got a thousand books in this apartment. And these are going to hold the heat and then radiate it. And that may be another factor. Maybe make it more difficult to her to actually cool her apartment. She needs to get out of the building for her necessities, but that could be an issue when it's really hot. She's also in a rent control apartment, which suggests from the vignette that she may be socioeconomically uh, challenged in this. So I think my five minutes are up. But I wanted to take this and think about the, the, the actual impacts on a real person. Um, from the daughter's perspective, adding climate change to the other challenges of caregiving is just going to make it that much more difficult. It may actually necessitate a move for Betty. So thank you. And Dr. Bass is next. So um, I'm honored to be here on this public health um, panel, even though I'm not a public health person, but I love that I'm here because I actually teach a class on One Health um, and advocates this intersectoral combination or crossover. So I appreciate this, the opportunity to be here. So, oh, that was the wrong one. So what I'm going to do is change this, the scene a little bit. Not that far though. <laughs> and talk about um, the many diseases that are caused by viruses or parasites and how they're, uh, these, they're, they're governed by many complex factors that can affect the relationships between the host and the vectors and actually also affect their potential distributions. Um, and I'm going to start with an example from the animal world, so bear with me a little bit here. Uh, this um, is an example of probably the first directly linked change in the distribution of a virus caused by the climate change. Um, and this is late, this occurred right here in the, in the Arctic, so close to us. The star of the show is the heart seal. These are primarily ice seals that spend their lives in um, ice dominated landscapes. And they're also the reservoir for bosine distemper virus. This is a mobility virus, it's highly contagious. And it's actually a relative of the measles virus uh, that, that y'all know from humans. Now, the Arctic, as we know, has been shrinking. As the shrinking, uh, shrinkage occurs, these ice lanes are starting to open up. Um, and whereas some people see this as an economic advantage, uh, the animals actually see this as a way to increase their feeding territories. So these seals are moving uh, a little bit further apart uh, from their typical ranges. They're encountering other ice seals that are present and subsequently transmitting the mobility virus, the PDV, to those other species. Those in turn are interacting with other seals in the North Pacific. That PDV has now, is now considered to be endemic in the North Pacific. It's also even spread to otters, sea otters. 
So marine mammals definitely have it. So we're gonna switch gears now and talk about those, um, those viruses, especially the arboviral um, viruses that are likely changing in distribution or have changed or definitely um, affected by climate. Uh, weather, we can um, specifically say. So a great example is the West Nile virus. This was first discovered in 1937 in Uganda, um, and it was documented in 1999 in the United States with the deaths of crows and jays in New York State. First of all, people didn't know why these birds were dying. Imagine seeing these birds just probably going to die. Um, a little unnerving, maybe like a, a Hitchcock film. So... <laughs> Uh, West Nile virus uh, quickly spread across the continental United States. Since 90, 1999, there have been 52,000 cases with a death rate of approximately 4%. Uh, morbidity rates are probably higher. Um, this is a, a great example of how the vector species controls what we know or, um, or likely controls the distribution of this virus. So Culex mosquitoes are the, the, the common house mosquitoes that you've probably killed some of, are the primary vector for this, this virus. Most um, attempts to control the virus are now based on predictive outbreak models. And these models incorporate factors such as temperature, vapor pressure, um, and also rainfall, all things that affect the reproduction the survival and growth of the culex mosquitoes. Dengue virus is another good example of an of a arbovirus. These are, this is primarily found in the tropics and the subtropics, has a long history, uh, first documented in the 1600s in the Caribbean and also in Central America. Um, dengue virus is considered a neglected tropical disease. And this is where the justice part comes in. Um, neglected tropical diseases are usually in areas of low income or low GDP countries, um, and not a lot of work goes into trying to find a vaccine for these viruses or to understand the processes governing their distribution. The mosquitoes that are implicated for these, this virus or this virus, dengue, are the Aedes mosquitoes. The Aedes mosquitoes are actually the distribution is controlled or um, you can identify the distribution based on a 10 degrees Celsius isotherm present in both the northern and the southern hemisphere. As that isotherm changes, likely the, um, the, the uh, distribution of these Aedes mosquitoes is going to change. And there's two specific species. We do have Aedes mosquitoes here, and dengue virus has been identified in individuals in the state of Maine, but at least at this time it's a low, uh, low frequency. Now, this brings me to Leishmania. Um, this is a nasty parasitic um, a protozoal parasite. It is very similar to the arboviruses in the sense that it's driven, um, the patterns of it are driven by vectors. Um, it's specifically the phlebotomous uh, sandfly. This uh, is present uh, in, on every continent except for Antarctica and Australia. Um, and it's also even considered to be endemic in the United States. Um, and this is a very disfiguring um, parasite. Uh, if you do a little search, you can look it up. Um, it, it, but I warn you, uh, when my students present on this, I say you got you to gotta give a warning, a trigger warning for it, because it, it's, it's very bad. This one um, is linked to at least um, between 700,000 and 1 million new cases annually. On a global scale. Um, oh, so the they actually have demonstrated a range expansion for it in Italy. Um, most of that is driven um, not just by climate, but also by migration of individuals um, from African countries and war torn areas. So people have moved into Italy and it's also spread northward, um, subsequent to that, and also southward on um, range expansions within Italy itself. Now that brings me to the helmet worms. Um, the helmet worms, um, uh, their global disease burden um, is rivaled only by malaria and tuberculosis. Uh, about 2 billion people are estimated to be affected by these types of worms. 
Um, and I've given you some examples here. They're quite, um, quite good looking. Um, <laughs> the hookworm and the whipworm. Y'all also probably at some point in biology have actually um, dissected a roundworm. Those of you who remember that, um, those are also part of this group of hummingworms. They are soil transmitted, meaning that their eggs, their larval stages are typically in the soil. Increased temperatures can decrease the duration of development for these stages, therefore decreasing the time for infectivity. Um, and so those, their distributions are predicted to, end, or their abundance has been predicted to increase in temperate regions. So for us, uh, we'll have to watch out more for these. Um, and then finally, the, the other kind of, uh, another, I'm not sure if it's considered a neglected tropical Disease, but this one takes a huge toll. Um, it's traditionally ranges in Africa, uh, the Caribbean, and South America and Asia. And about 236.6 million people are affected by um, schistosoma or schistosomiasis is the, the disease that it's called. There are three different species of, of schistosoma that cause this. These are a little bit different in that they have a little bit more complex parasitic lifestyle or life cycle. Uh, they uh, require this intermediate host, these aquatic snails, um, and then the definitive host, which is actually primates, of which we are primates. Um, so in some regions, the humans are actually the specific reservoir for this, um, for schistosoma. Modeling has predicted um, kind of varying results of, uh, of, of the impact of climate change on the distribution of schistosoma. In some regions, it looks like it's going to decrease. In other regions, regions it's going to increase. And um, as relatively recently, they've seen some evidence of schistosomiasis entering southern Europe. Um, and likely what we're going to see are range shifts with these types of parasites as, as, as compared to simply uh, range expansion. So I'm going to stop there. I don't know how many presentations I've been to with Dr. Bass. She always starts with, I'm not, I don't have a background in public health. I'm going to say you are ordained in public health. <laughs> That's just what you are. This makes Thank it official. <laughs> so thanks for having me here today. And thanks for hanging around for the last panel. <laughs> I appreciate it. So my name is Jen, and I am the director of the Area Health Education Center, as well as an assistant clinical professor. In my training and background, I'm actually an infectious disease epidemiologist. And not many people would know what that is. And then COVID happened, and now everybody knows what it is, so it's great. And so as an epidemiologist, I can speak about a few things. The first thing that I can speak to is I can tell you that if you fail undergraduate organic chemistry, you too can still have a wonderful and meaningful career in the health field. <laughs> I am living proof of that. Um, the other thing that I can really speak to is the critical importance of data to understand and react to problems effectively. I forgot I'm this age. I need my glasses. And I can speak to the fact that I have a little bit more expertise than social media on outbreaks. And the message I want to send you today is that climate change is an outbreak. And it should be investigated, controlled, and prevented in the same imperative way that we do with traditional infectious diseases. Outbreak basically means that we see more of a condition than we expect. And the first step in an outbreak investigation is to verify that we have an actual outbreak on our hands. Well, the science is crystal clear on climate change. We are, experiencing we are experiencing increased frequency of natural disasters, warming temperatures, glaciers melting, the list can go on. And these changes are more than what we would and should expect. So what do climate change, uh, what do climate change outbreaks look like? And Dr. Bass provided a little bit of an insight of what those vector-borne climate change outbreaks could look like but they also look like different things. It looks like sudden, ho sudden housing instability due to people with financial means moving north, away from areas of intense heat 
and causing rising home costs to make mortgages and rents unaffordable to many. I'm sure many of you dealing with rent can maybe appreciate that. It looks like an infodemic, which is the rapid amplification and replication of myths and disinformation that deny the human's role in climate change with instant messaging apps being the culprit. It looks like increased acts of racism experienced by communities of color who live in unhealthy homes in unsafe neighborhoods, not resilient to changes in climate as a result of historic redlining policies that Dr. Arafat had alluded to. So, okay, we've established that climate change is indeed an outbreak. So now what do we do about it? Outbreaks then require careful and robust data collection to understand the impact and the burden of the condition. This is actually a wonderful opportunity to be creative, to collect data and analyze it in new ways to understand the impact of climate change, particularly for those communities at risk for health inequities. So in public health, we have to look beyond the rates of disease and look at social determinants of health. And ultimately, in an outbreak, our goal is to prevent and control with evidence-based strategies. First, this will require more research on what works and doesn't work. There's a lot of pressure on young people to help take up that cause. Second, it takes action based on the data. This means not just changing knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors of individuals, but also changing policies, governance, societal values, otherwise known as the structural determinants of health. Now, when an outbreak happens, there's a sense of urgency. We have, to, uh, we have a race against time to identify causes and control the spread of disease. Look how fast we implemented vaccine policies for COVID-19. Look how fast we recall things like spinach and chicken because of salmonella outbreaks. We closed beaches for E. coli outbreaks. One time when I worked for the state, we almost shut down a whole prom at a high school in Maine for, a, for an outbreak of whooping cough. We do those things because they work and because we need to do it with a sense of urgency. And it's with this same urgency that is critical to addressing climate change as an outbreak. I'm gonna end with a story that is 26 years old. In other words, a lot older than many of you in this room. But for those that remember, does anyone remember where the 1996 Summer Olympics were held? Atlanta, Georgia, where I went to graduate school, lovely city. Well, during that time that Atlanta hosted the Olympics, and I don't know if anyone's ever been to a place where they have the Olympics or large events, they pretty much shut down the city to traffic. The only traffic that was allowed on the roads were those to support the athletes and for essential workers. It was also the perfect time to do a public health research study. And so Dr. Michael Frieden and colleagues, a team of researchers, conducted a study to examine traffic changes in Atlanta and how it related to changes in air quality and childhood asthma, acute asthma events like asthma attacks in children. The results, not surprising, there's a decrease in weekday traffic. There was a decrease in the daily ozone concentration. And no surprise, there was a statistically significant, so all those taking statistics or however, like, I know what that means, drop in healthcare visits, including visits to the doctor and visits to the emergency department for acute asthma attacks in children. In other words, children did not struggle to breathe when there was less traffic. According to the Maine State Health Department, more than, there are more than 8,000 visits to the emergency department every year for children for acute asthma attacks and 943 hospitalizations of children for the same reason. We have become, these numbers 
have become what we expect each year. So now let's take a minute. Let's imagine that we consider 8,000 emergency department visits and 943 hospitalizations a year for children for asthma attacks is more than what we expect and treated that as a climate change outbreak. What if we urgently responded to that with strategies that we know that work? What would happen? We would literally stop traffic. So maybe, okay, that's a little bit extreme. But what we could do is build communities that remediate the effects of climate change and children could actually breathe better. Okay, I'd like to um, thank you all for your wonderful comments on protecting public health. Um, at this time, I'd like to open up for questions and comments for our audience. Um, feel free to direct your comment at a specific panelist or the entire panel. If you have a question, you can just raise your hand. That'd be fine. Uh, thank you so much to a lot of you. I really appreciate this. I find this really inspiring. Um, and you have to, I apologize, I'm going to put you on the hot seat. Um, I have been uh, incredibly disappointed by the lack of uh, organization from human health at UNE to create an institute around climate change, aspects on human health, or uh, a curriculum. Um, or anything, I, I don't know, that perhaps there is some, and, uh, but I, I see this just further inspires me and raises my ire that we aren't circling the horses and, and really building infrastructure around it. Um, whether that's organized curriculum, whether it's a subcommittee of the environment of the council, or whether that's greater programming in the climate change studies minor that I'm looking at right now, it has zero dedicated classes exclusively to human health. So I guess I, I want to ask you all uh, your thoughts on how, how we can change that. Um, I, was, I would love to see some positive momentum organization to that effect. I'm going to start. Um, I've been calling for a core curriculum for every, for all uh, uh, undergrads and also including uh, graduate school uh, to have different graduate schools to talk about climate change and human health. And, uh, you know, in medical school, we need that. Our students need that uh, to talk about climate change and the toxins and environmental uh, impact on health. Um, and, um, it's just everybody's so busy. That's really a fact. And I mean, we talked here, and we talked about that many times to have this uh, curriculum because we sit on the, uh, um, you know, the planetary health council, uh, both of us. So, um, and Jen was part of the, that, you know, program in the very beginning. So, um, I don't know if you want to add something. I, I would put my one health class on your um in your in your climate study um there's students right here right now who are taking my one health class do we talk about climate change mm -hmm. we talk about it quite a bit in there so there there's one yes that, that would be wonderful and i would just add to that i don't know if you've noticed i think it was just recently there was legislation put before the before maine about including climate change in high school curriculum um, and if you're going to do that, you need to provide the curriculum and the standards. And we can talk all day about like how can we incorporate into accreditation, blah, blah, blah. But what I'll say is y'all students have a loud voice, mm -hmm. way louder than any of us on the panel. Mm -hmm. To the moment that you can talk to the new provost and leadership and say, this is what we want. This is what's important to us. You're going to get it a lot further than any of us in this room can. Mm -hmm. So I'd say empower our students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to also add something. That at least in the medical school now we have uh, incorporated aspects on in the environment and on social determinants of health throughout our curriculum. 
throughout the whole curriculum. So when we even write cases about patients and we talk about uh, environmental uh, factors that impact their health. So uh, we're trying to do that. It's just, uh, you know, a little by little, I think. But at the end, you'll see that maybe two years ago, nobody was talking about these issues at all. Now almost everyone comes and talks about them, uh, incorporating them within their teaching materials. So just really quickly, I promise kind of we're running out of time. So I would say, so part of my, my day job, I guess, is um, coordinating the undergraduate public health program. So Jen and I have both been in that role. So one of the things that we recognize, so not only am I coordinating um, students that are majoring in public health, but also minors, which varies for so students that are in my bio, environmental studies, et cetera. So one of the things that has been a push is kind of looking at these issues related to climate change. So one of the things that we took as a um, kind of a curriculum group is to actually incorporate the One Health class within our curriculum. Um, that came from student uh, feedback, discussion, collaboration, creative partnerships. Um, it's really gonna take people's voices. I think it's really important. I can echo what um, Jen just said, it's gonna come down to you all as students to really push this and we want this. We need this and here's why. Just from a public health perspective, having health professionals that have this background, not only um, they can serve as models or change agents for just engaging in healthier behaviors, but also can be those change agents within communities. So public health professionals really need to be at the table um, to make these changes at the local level. So it's that health and all policies approach. I think of health impact assessments, you name it. So there's a lot of places for conversation and growth. Also, this kind of knowledge does not exist, exist in textbooks. It's only going to exist through us, you know, educating the students about, about the issues. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left, so we have time for about one or two more questions. Um, again, let's just raise your hand and I can choose you up for the audience. I'm trying to get my students I'm not doing a good job. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll ask you. Um, is this still on? Um, I have a question for Anna. How do I avoid all those nasty bugs? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, for the mosquitoes, um, you know what to do for that. <laughs> some of the other things in this state is um, the schistosomiasis says is really about poor sanitation because uh, that is uh, the eggs are being released and people with that uh, material or urine. So stay away from places or encourage people to uh, do that in a lot of environments. <laughs> it's very common in Egypt. It's just a Samaritan. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's because, uh, you know, the, the shells or those, uh, you know, uh, the life cycle of the of schistosomiasis, basically they have these uh, grow on the sides of the Nile River and people go in and they're going to the water. So basically they have these little nasty things called the cercaria, they go into the skin and they inhabit the, you know, either the colon or the bladder and they cause colon cancer and bladder cancer. So it's really nasty things. An Egyptian person. Okay, to uh, wrap up our panel, I'll actually ask a question for our panelists. Um, so health issues related to climate change do not affect everyone equally as, as we have seen tonight. Um, so how would you recommend prioritizing those who are at higher risk? Um, health issues related to climate change do not affect everybody equally. So how can we go about prioritizing um, those who are at higher risk? You know, that question brings to mind what's happening in COVID with older adults, how many people are saying that these people are expendable. Well, they're older, they've lived their lives. Maybe they should step out of the way. And I think there's a value aspect to that question that is really important. I think there's also a data and numbers aspect to that question. Um, and I, I think a lot has to do with um, the kind of resources that we're willing to commit. I, I, I worry that we will ration unnecessarily. Maybe it's rationing through neglect. Uh, and that, I think that's a real concern. It's a good question. <laughs> I'm going to argue something maybe the way to not answer the question is do we need to prioritize? Um, maybe we all have enough passion and resources to be able to 
distribute what we have in an equitable way. And the way to maybe hit sort of first are those people who have the hardest time struggling to get to resources. Um, so I'd say, I think it's hard in our society when we say, do we put these people before that people? Um, it's maybe just about, you don't have to put anyone before anyone else. It's about how we want to be equitable and just making sure that our resources are spread that way. I, I will also add one point about uh, policies mm -hmm. and uh, um, uh, because everything starts with policies and we saw it happen in Flint, Michigan and how government policies led to poison of the water in uh, Flint, Michigan. And people are, you know, children are having you know, poisoning because of, uh, of what happened with the water and pipes in, in, those, uh, in this city. So definitely then I showed you in the very first slide that I have how government policies and, and and, and, and politics impact health all the way to the quality of health and uh, um, access to health. And, 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 and it starts there, actually. Everything starts with government policies because if we are, uh, if we care enough, we will make the right policies that impact the people who deserve it the most. Great answers, thank you. So we have come to the end of the hour. Um, please join me in thanking our panelists and everyone who participated in this discussion today.